my great personal pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker and guest of honour, Con Abelman. Um, I first heard about Con actually from Bernard Cornwell, um, who had just read his debut book. Um, I've known Bernard for 20 years, and it's the only time he's ever written to me personally to recommend anything. Um, so I read Con's debut actually in a difficult situation with Con because I had very high expectations and it had to be a bit of a rush. And uh, nevertheless, I've bowled over. Um, I thought it actually the best adventure debut since Walter Smith's When the Lion Feeds. It's so strong, so confident, and yet he was a new author dealing with one of the strongest, best known, biggest names in all of history, Junior Caesar. Absolutely remarkable. Um, a number of years later, I was asked to choose my landmark novels of the first 10 years of the Historical Law Society, and believe it or not, I didn't choose Case of uh, Rome because by that stage, Con had, in my opinion, written a book that I thought was even better. His first became his novel, All the Friends. Um, so having covered Rome and the great Mongolian empires, Con's latest series, The Wars of the Roses, turns his eyes for the first time to the matter of England. Who better could we have it? Ladies and gentlemen, Con. Very nice crowd to want to applaud. <laughs> that first couple of minutes. Thank you very much. Um, right, I better start. I I do have a plan. Those of you who have seen me speak before will be pleased to hear that. Um, <laughs> historical fiction has two main strands, two faces. The first is history. The second, if you'll allow me to just look at my notes for a moment. Ah yes, it's fiction. <laughs> I'll give an example. If I was writing historical fiction and I picked a story, for example, George Mallory and Andrew Irving, 1924, their attempt on Everest. One of the first attempts with bottled oxygen. Irving was the expert, as you'll probably know, they had a team, and the third man of the team saw the two of them just before the final ascent, about 800 vertical feet off the peak of Everest, when he lost sight of them because the weather came in, storm, making them invisible. And then they lost the bodies until 1999, when George Mallory's body was discovered, without his camera, tragically. A typical English amateur thing, he hadn't had a camera with him, he had to borrow it off another climber on the way up. But that particular camera, of course, is crucial because it will contain pictures from the peak of Everest. Or, or not, if you never reached it, and no one knows. Now, if you were writing that as a historical fiction story, you can't leave it at that. You would have to make a decision that would infuriate all of the people who either think he did get to the top of Everest, or the people who think that he never come even near it. I, I did a bit of research on this. I looked up Edmund Hillary's opinion on the matter. And he said, I am rather inclined to think that maybe it is quite important, the getting down. And the complete climb of a mountain is getting to the top and getting down again. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not an unreasonable point of view. <laughs> but this is the point. Occasionally, true histories, they can be incomplete or they can be far-fetched. And I, I've got an example of that from my own father's life of a story that is far-fetched and impossible. I could never use this in fiction because it just seems, it's, it's ridiculous. He was towing gliders to Arnhem in uh, 1944. Uh, he was flying a Halifax, which is a twin-engine plane, and the glider was attached by a cable. It's quite a dangerous activity because what used to happen was as you come off the uh, ground, the glider would come up very quickly, pulling the tail of the plane up, and then you go straight in again. So he always had his friend Tiny, who was obviously a huge man, with his feet on the uh, dashboard, I think is the right word for a plane, and he had his, uh, his both hands on the release, and if Dad felt the tail coming up, Tiny would shout, now, and Tiny would pull the release, and the glider would cut the cable, and then they'd go around and try it all over again. But, I'm now thinking about microphones again, ladies and gentlemen. It's a shocking thing. Can you hear me without the microphone? No. no. no right, OK, all right. 
When my father took off for the Arnhem uh, dropping of gliders into Holland, he was with hundreds and hundreds of other planes and great flotillas taking these gliders over to Holland. And it was a huge enterprise, planes taking off in threes and fours right across the airfield over and over again in waves going into the sky. And as my dad took off, one of his two engines packed up. And he was in a very difficult situation. He could get the glider into the air, but he knew that there was a great dog leg of a course that had been cleared. And by cleared, I mean that fighters and bombers had gone over and shot up the ground and any possible uh, resistance so that when the completely defenseless towing planes with their gliders came over later, there wouldn't be anyone to knock them out. And that dog leg had been cleared and Dad knew that he couldn't possibly keep up with the flotilla of planes as they were heading along that dog leg. So he decided to cut the dog leg. Pythagorean uh, triangle, very simple, he went along the hypotenuse and arrived in Holland at Buffley the same time as everyone else. Well, that's not an extraordinary story. He detached the glider safely, he came home. But 50 years later, in 1994, in Sydney, Australia, my brother was sitting at a bar when he heard some old men talking and they were commemorating 50 years after Arnhem. But one of them said, you know, boys, the thing that's always bothered me is why everyone else went on that great dog leg and we were towed Along the <laughs> and my brother was honestly able to turn around and say, I think I might be able to help you. <laughs> now, if I put that in a story, it would, they say, oh, a ridiculous forced coincidence. You know, can you, can you imagine the artificiality of something like that? But that actually happened. Um, extraordinary coincidences do happen in real life and real histories. And as I say, although I sort of said it as a joke at the beginning, that history means fiction and fiction means history, but history is often helped a little by filling in those gaps. It's what a historical fiction writer does. And it's a little controversial to say it because, as Bernard Cornwall said, um, if you don't take care with the historical research, you might as well put a brain gun on a Napoleonic warship. It's not a very snappy phrase, but it sort of makes the point. Um, <laughs> You know, you, you, your duty is to do the research as much as humanly possible because I know, as a reader of historical fiction, that I learned about the Victorians uh, reading Flashman, for example. And I learned about the Napoleonic Navy um, reading O'Brien, Patrick O'Brien. And I learned about, oh, I don't know, Hong Kong reading Taipan and by James Clavell and so on and so on and so on. And you don't want to have the awful situation where something you have learned as true turns out not to be. That would be an absolute disaster. Did King John read it? Was King John, the king died of a surfeit of eels. Was that King John? Henry the First. Henry the First. Which one? Henry the First. Henry the First. Henry the First. Henry the First. Did Richard the Third kill his nephews? How long have you gone? because I am writing the story of Wars of the Roses, so I'm, I'm covering Richard III. What an extraordinary thing it was to discover that his spine had a great serpentine twist. And we all thought it was Tudor propaganda in old Shakespeare, you know, making him this awful evil arch-villain with this ridiculous hump. But in fact, I always wondered about that because I had a friend who was a professional fencer. He was semi-professional. He was thinking of going full-time. And he developed a hump. And he was using a, an epée, a very light blade, and his right shoulder, this muscle back here, which in me is almost negligible, but with him it became a rather large and disfiguring hump. And he pretty much gave it up because, as he said, I want to find a wife. I'll never, <laughs> I'll never go for me like this. <laughs> but I always thought, before the whole digging up of the king's body in the car park thing, I always thought that I was, go I was going to get away with the fact that he was likely to have had a swordsman's hump. I suspect something that you could never see in any of the old films um, is all the Roman legions were disfigured, were had enormous right arms and enormous shoulders. I suspect that every swordsman had a hugely powerful right arm and shoulder, which wouldn't look odd. We do know not a single contemporary source of Richard III ever referred to his hump or physical disfigurement. So we know it wasn't unusual. We know that nobody remarked on it in his lifetime. And that means that I suspect, even if he did have this raised right shoulder, it would have been a fairly normal swordsman's 
uh, disfigurement or sores that hump and no one would have noticed it at all. And that's absolutely uh, a decision I'm going to have to make. Which way to go? Either way, no matter which way I go, I'm going to upset someone. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you, man. <laughs> and then Tudor the propaganda cuts both ways. And then what I was thinking of, what would I, what would I be saying to you? I was thinking about Tudor propaganda, and listen to this. It was written by a man. In turning over in my mind the contents of your last letters, I have put myself into great agony, not knowing how to interpret them whether to my disadvantage, as you show in some places, or to my advantage, as I understand them in some others, beseeching you earnestly to let me know expressly your whole mind as to the love between us two. Henry VIII. Very good. I have to say, I wasn't expecting anyone to identify that. Henry VIII writing to Anne Boleyn. A man to, does anyone else remember a history teacher sneering at the idea that a man so coarse could have written green sleeves? Is that just, oh, is it just me? Yeah. Really? <laughs> Possibly I had a Catholic uh, history teacher. So. <laughs> <laughs> I genuinely expect half of the room to nod away at that. Oh, an extraordinary thing. <laughs> However, a man that is generally considered to be a big, shouty, rough, tennis playing, I know that doesn't quite fit in, um, <laughs> six foot two, uh, at the age of 25 he was six foot two and twelve and a half stone, which I always remember because I too was six foot two and twelve and a half stone at 25, and yes, I'm aware of the fact that that is a warning for all of us. <laughs> One example I want to give though from history is something that was very important to me, was the life of Brutus. I, when I started to write about Julius Caesar, I needed to know about Brutus, so I read Plutarch's Lives. Um, a Greek from the first century, and he wrote this about Brutus. But those who were ill affected towards him on account of his participation in Caesar's murder would not allow that he was descended from Junius Brutus, whose family they said was extinct with his two sons. Marcus Brutus, according to them, was a plebeian, or plebeian, descended from one Brutus, a steward of mean extraction. So, Plutarch can have it both ways. He can say that some people believed Brutus was of noble stock and others believed that he was of common stock because he was a historian, so he could say this is fact. But if you write a historical fiction, you don't have that luxury, you have to make a choice. And if you make a choice, you will upset all the people who believe something completely different. And to this day, I still get letters from people saying, how can I write this sort of peculiar thing because Brutus was Julius Caesar's son and we all know it. Even though Brutus was engaged at one point to Julius Caesar's daughter, and even in gay old Rome, you did not, you did not engage your son to your daughter. You know, there, are, uh, there are limits to this sort of thing. But the point is, the point I'm trying to make is that history can have gaps, and when it has gaps, it is the joy and the responsibility of a historical fiction writer to fill them intelligently. No one knows, for example, why. Julius Caesar was let go by Cornelius Sulla. Cornelius Sulla said of him, I think two of his uncle walk on those legs. And his uncle Marius was a dangerous man who had some, been part of a civil war that had almost destroyed Rome. And yet, Cornelius Sulla let the boy go. Let the cocky young man, the loose belted, loose clothed young man go. No one knows why that happened. If you're writing the scene, you have to make your best guess. When Julius Caesar, at the age of 19, was held for ransom by pirates, dear God, you couldn't make it up. And they had him in captivity for some months. And while the money was being raised, he sang to them and he told them stories and uh, he told, uh, talked to them. But all the time he said, of course, when I get out, I will find you. And I will have you all crucified. I may have your officers strangled out of mercy, which is, you know, if a 19 year old a decent thing to offer. Um, and they had to, while the money was being raised, they had him in captivity, as I say, for some months, but eventually he was set free and dropped off on the north coast of Africa. Now, we don't know what happened next. Julius Caesar, at the age of 19, somehow managed to achieve extraordinary things. Over the next couple of uh, six or eight weeks, he moved along that north coast of Africa and he collected young men 
how exactly he did this, I don't know. He must have literally gone into villages and made some sort of a speech, made a recruiter's argument. And he was successful. He collected a group of young men, and also he managed to collect funds. Now, how, how young men uh, you know, alone on the north coast of Africa managed to get a bit of money, I don't know. Um, maybe they robbed people. I mean, it could have been that. But that part of the history is gone. All we know is that when he arrived at the Roman port, he had enough money to hire a ship and enough men to crew that ship. And then at the age of 19, he went out onto the Mediterranean. He crisscrossed it until they found that same group of pirates. They fought a sea battle. And they, he did indeed have them crucified up and down the north coast of Africa because he was nothing if not a young man of his word. The point, the point is, however, that again, in historical fiction novel, I can't leave a period of two months where nothing happens and then have him appear with a ship and a crew. I would have to fill that gap, so I did the best I possibly could. And I remember that the Roman uh, Republic, as it was then, was in the habit of letting soldiers go to small plots in North Africa when they retired. And I thought to myself, you know, if you had a few hundred of those guys in a village or a town along the north coast of Africa, and they all had children, those young men would grow up with an idea of Rome where they wouldn't perhaps expect ever to actually be a soldier. And then, lo and behold, one day, an African junior sees and walks into their village and asks them if they want to go on an adventure. And you never know, that might have been exactly what happened. Or nothing like that at all. But then I have to... Uh, <laughs> My responsibility is to fill the gap. I should have said at the beginning, I know people are happy usually to ask questions at the end, but if there are any questions during, I quite like what was happening with the panel a bit there. I can see you're a good crowd and trustworthy. So if, <laughs> if you have any questions at any point during it, for example, about my historical fiction, um, or indeed my own writing career, I'm happy to answer them. I won't expect it immediately. I was a teacher for seven years. I'm quite comfortable with the whole hand in the air thing. It works very well. Um, like a lot of teachers, oh, well, I wasn't expecting it right now. No, <laughs> no why not? Go on, why not? We'll try it. Yes. Have you ever regretted when we filled the gap with? <sighs> yes. That's, that's a great question. Um, yes. When I had to, I, I wrote a fifth book recently about Augustus. I wanted to finish the story because there were 23 assassins of Julius Caesar and not one of them died a natural death. And I, I knew for years that that would make an interesting story. And I wanted to do the rise of Augustus in the immediate aftermath of his assassination as well. So I, you know, uh, I'm trying to think quite now. The point is I had to read through the series. And as I read through the first four books, I thought to myself, with the first one, I can do better. Than this. I was not disappointed. It was the best I could possibly do at the time, but it would be very odd if 10 years later, having written continuously for 10 years, if I didn't go back and think, I could do better. There were one or two choices I'd made back at the beginning. Putting Brutus and Caesar together so early is by far the most controversial. Um, I can't regret it because it did get the series, it launched the series and launched the career. And after all, I had been trying to get published from the age of 13. So, you know, I, I'd always say what, whatever opened the door to my big boot is, uh, is good enough. But I made decisions back then and I can only stand in awe of the confidence um, that I had. Because I had, with that first book, The Gates of Rome, I had no one looking over my shoulder and saying, that's not how you write historical fiction, son. You need to do it like this. So, uh, for example, I, I put in somebody who could heal with his hands. I'm still getting a slight feeling of nervousness saying that out loud. Um, because it's effectively a complete fantasy element. But I, had to, I remember how it came about because I had to explain the Ides of March. And if, you, if the Ides of March were either accept that people told Julius Caesar, not just on the day or so before his assassination, but months and years before, that he should avoid the Ides of March. If you accept that there's a bit of future foretelling going on then, then it's accepting effectively that there's magic. It is more likely, we know, from Claudius um, being told by his wife not to go back and revise the histories again because there were too many hands on it already, <laughs> that the odds are that people, have, they added in a sense of portentous magic to Caesar's story to make it, you know, it's, it's a foundation story of empire. They added that in, the odds are. But I, nonetheless, I sort of felt I had a, chink where I could put in effectively magic and uh, grab it with both hands. I look back on that younger man with, and his confidence to do so, you know, with awe. Do you know, the strange thing is, I still get emails saying, oh, you've got the shield shape wrong or the colour of the tunic, the famous tunic colour debate. But no one, no one emails me to say, 
you had someone heal with his hands. <laughs> Isn't it funny? You know, you can get away with, with the big stuff, but the small stuff drives people crazy. <laughs> Well, that was a lovely question. Yes, go on, please. Uh, how do you feel about using quotes from primary sources in a historical novel? Well, I almost, I mean, I, I do sometimes at the beginning of sections. I did it deliberately in one of the Wars of the Roses one because I was told by a copy editor not to use the word majesty because Henry VIII was the first king to insist on majesty and anyone before him would not have used it. And then I found uh, one of the Paston uh, letters commenting on which, no, I'm sorry, it was an original uh, letter by Richard III, what's the third? Richard Duke of York, I do apologise, and he said, uh, in duty your majesty, referring to King Henry VI, and he started M-A-G-E-S-T-E-E, -E, as, as you know, the spelling is completely fluid, but I put that in delivery because I wanted people to see majesty, that you actually, no, it was used, it wasn't used commonly, but, you know, but in, uh, apart from that, there's always a little bit of a game you're playing to some extent, because I mean, I'm dealing with a Chaucerian English period, and I can't use Chaucerian English. Um, I can't really spell Sergeant with a J and wife with a W, Y, F, and so on and so on. If I did, it would be instantly unreadable. And uh, so while I'm tending to go for that, like those words of Henry VIII earlier, I'm, if you like, using as clear English as I can and deliberately avoiding um, more modern terms like silhouette. For example, I won't use the word because of Etienne to silhouette being a, an anachronism much later on. I, you know, I don't use laser or computer or anything like that. Um, <laughs> although, you know, I got so annoyed at one point by the people who were emailing me about uh, Roman tunics that I seriously, seriously considered putting a telescope into a Junior Caesar box. <laughs> Just to be infuriated. I mean, it got as far. It honestly got so. It got through the first draft. You know, it, it was, I, I had to. I was thinking, because I had this whole argument, because the ancient Assyrians described Saturn as being uh, surrounded by a snake biting its own tail. Now, you can't see Saturn with the naked eye, so I thought, you know, that's interesting. And also, in the British Museum, there's the Nimrod lens, which is 5th century BC, and it's a convex rock crystal lens. You put two of those together in a sleeve, and you've got a telescope. And I thought, I can actually defend this. Not only can I put this in, but I can, make, I can at least put some sort of argument together. And then I thought, no, if I put that in the historical note at the back, they won't reach that. They'll get to telescope, throw the book against the wall, <laughs> and then I'll, I'll have lost my reader, so I chose not to in the end. I cut it out. Actually, the, the, I, I missed one reference to it in the first edition that had to be cut out later. So there is a first edition out of the World Telescope. But apart, from that, <laughs> apart from that, that was just an early story. Yes? Sorry to keep my hands going. I'll just follow up to that. How do you decide the type of language? Characters, particularly different nationalities, use. And look, I'm just thinking, Lindsay Davis quite famously said that when she was thinking about her ancient British characters as opposed to her Roman characters, she based them on her Brummy friends. <laughs> and in the radio adaptation, they gave all the ancient British Birmingham accents. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like that. <laughs> to be honest, I, I would say the, the simple answer is that I try and keep the language simple and less ornate. If, I mean, the thing I try to avoid, obviously, is idiom and um, you know, unusual phrases that are key to particular areas or, or particular, I, you know, I, I guess I avoid vocabulary of silhouette and boycott and, and this sort of you know, thing if they have obvious hooligan, if they have obvious origins. Um, but otherwise, I, yeah, I'll just try and express myself as clearly as possible, being George Orwell style of historical fiction, I guess. Uh, any other questions at this point? We're doing brilliantly, by the way. Yes? Yes. Tricks like this. That was it. Allow you to explain things without really taking uh, sides. Well, I only used magic once and sort of regretted it for 10 years. So it's. Uh, <laughs> so it's you recommend not to use it at all? Well, I honestly. There was a, a year or two ago, I was looking around for other subjects. Before I did Wars of the Roses, um, I looked at Al Capone, for example, as a fantastic subject. But I also looked at Arthur. And I studied Arthurian literature in university, and I could not get around how to handle magic in the text. You either, either Merlin is just a charlatan and a trickster and a, and a fake, which is just a little bit sad at the end of the day. Um, or you, you go the whole hog and then you write a fantasy novel. And I'm not quite there yet. Although I've read fantasy and love fantasy, I, I'm not quite ready to, uh, to write it. Shall I tell you that Al Capone's report is a perfect example of two short historical stories. How are we doing for time? Loads 
of time. <laughs> yes, well, I'm not doing too bad anyway. I'll tell you two, if you don't mind, I'll tell you two short, honestly, uh, historical stories which make the point. First is Al Capone's lawyer, who's a man called Easy Ed. Um, he was immensely valued by Al Capone because he was the one who was very good at using money. And Al Capone was spending, in 1927, he was spending $600,000 a week on bribery. It works out in long terms it's about $800 million a year. In other words, you know, the, the output of a fairly major economy, Al Capone was spending solely on bribing the police, judges, lawyers, and rest of The point is that Easy Eddie could get the best bang for your buck, if you like. He was the one who was capable of uh, using that money well. And Al Capone knew that Easy Eddie was the man keeping his fellows out of prison. So he gave Easy Eddie everything he could possibly want. Riches, he gave him an entire Chicago city block. Um, cars, anything he could want. Women. And Easy Eddie had a son. And as the son grew older and he started to reach the point where he could ask his father exactly what he was doing for a living, and you know, the sort of men he was keeping out of jail, some of the most violent murderers in America, um, he began to worry about this. And I won't take up too much of your time, I'll just cut straight to the point that Easy Eddie's conscience troubled him and he decided to turn state's evidence against Al Capone. He was part of the final tax trial and that was a sentence of death because he was gunned down on the streets of Chicago shortly afterwards as he had known he would be. It was absolutely impossible to go against Al Capone in those days um, and expect to live through it. And when he was, uh, his body was checked, he had a poem in his pocket and this is the poem. The clock of life is wound but once. And no man has the power to tell just when the hands will stop at late or early hour. Now is the only time you own, live, love, toil with a will, place no faith in time, for the clock may soon be still. The second story is set uh, a little later, World War II. A man called Butch O'Hare took off from the Lexington carrier in the Pacific with his flight of uh, aircraft, and as he did so, he discovered that the fuel tanks had not been properly topped off. He actually didn't have enough fuel to get to his destination. So he signaled the squadron leader and said he had to return. As he returned to the Lexington, he intercepted a flight of Japanese Zeros coming to attack the Lexington, which was, at that point, effectively defenseless. They had anti-aircraft fire, but that hadn't worked too well in the past. And he knew that it was just him. His squadron couldn't get back in time. He was the only one in range to hit those planes. So he emptied his point .303 machine guns into it. I should say it's one of the first times that we actually had cameras mounted on the wings. So we know exactly what happened in this particular action. And first of all, he emptied his guns into the planes and took out two of them. And after that, he was out of bullets, and they were still heading towards the Lexington, so he began to use his plane as a weapon. And he attempted to use his wings to strike their flying surfaces, their, their wings, their tails, anything he could do to rip through some parts, some useful part of their plane. In doing so, he took out another three planes. All the time, they poured machine gun fire into him and into his craft. The final few planes decided, possibly running low on fuel after dogfighting with him, that they weren't going to continue on to the Lexington. They peeled off and went back. He effect landed on the Lexington deck, effectively crash landed. His plane was riddled with machine gun holes from one end to the other. He survived without a scratch. He was American Navy's first Medal of Honor winner of World War II. He was the the first American Navy's ace, as defined by five kills in combat of World War II. And after the war, his hometown um, wanted him to be remembered, so they <coughs> got a subscription together and they asked that the airport uh, be named after him, so that the airport in Chicago is O'Hare Airport. And if you go to Terminal 2, you can see a statue there of him, and uh, his medals are there. And they remember their favorite son. And the connection, of course, between those two stories is that Butch O'Hare was Easy Eddie's son. <laughs> in, 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 one, in two short stories, that's why I tell this story fiction, because, yes, history can have gaps, and it can be extraordinarily far-fetched occasionally, but it has an extraordinary power. Because it's true, because it really happened, because, because it's a true story, 
It gives a writer access to a sort of power that fiction writers can only dream of. And that's why I do it. That's why fiction benefits from history and history benefits from fiction. Why the two things do go hand in hand. That, that's such a good ending. I'm tempted to finish there. But <laughs> 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 yeah. Such a professional. But if you do... <laughs> Next time, yeah, we're okay. We're okay. <laughs> if you do have any questions at this point, you know, I've clearly finished. So, <laughs> but would you, shall I tell you a little bit about how I got into writing? First of all, because um, I was I was very young. I was 13 uh, when I got started, and I wrote uh, a book and actually sent it to a publisher. In those days, I believed it was only publishers who would accept these things. Um, I've learned since, by the way, that an agent is a very good idea. Yes, they will take 10%, possibly even 20%, but it's the old joke, you know, it's better to have 80% of something than 100% of nothing. Um, but in those days, I used to send them off. At the age of 13, I sent them off to publishers, and they would send them straight back with enormous enthusiasm. And so, um, I mean, it, it really was quite a self-destroying process because you could, you'd have to spend the money and get the photocopied. Uh, ideally, I would do it 15 or 20 times profit money went on it. All sorts of things. When I was an adult and I had access to photocopying machines in, in jobs, it was a little bit easier to see. <laughs> <laughs> the postage was still an extraordinary <coughs> expense. And I realised that I had to separate myself from the crowd. I, I understood that there were hundreds and hundreds of people writing and that I'd heard this term slush pile and I didn't like the, the sound of that. So. I tried everything. I wrote extraordinary um, oh, synopses of the books. I, I called myself at one point Oliver Brian Kenobi. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, thought, I thought that was brilliant. Just, just brilliant. But it had no effect whatsoever. And they said that straight back with such speed that I began to wonder if anyone was reading them at all. And I took a hair from my head and put them put it between the pages of each manuscript that I sent out. And sure enough, ladies and gentlemen, the, uh, the hairs were still there when they came back. And I said to an editor years and years later, uh, who's actually sitting in this room, I said to an editor, you know, it's funny uh, about this, I put this hairs from my head and all the rest of it. And he said, oh yes, lots of people do that. We always try and make sure the hairs go back in the same place. <laughs> <laughs> it is a hard business, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> However, well, after many years of this, and I wrote a book a year from the age of 13 to the age of about 26, something like that. And I began to realise that my expenditure of time was very inefficient, and I was writing for an entire year, and then I was getting back in weeks. So I thought, well, stuff that. I can write just beginnings. I can write beginnings like nobody's business. I could turn out beginnings ever so quickly, and then I'm writing for a much shorter period of time. And if they reject that, well, I have given less time to it. So I thought, this is brilliant. This is my tactic. So I wrote a lot of beginnings. And I sent those off, and sure enough, they came back. But at least I hadn't put that much time into it. And then one happy day, a publisher wrote back and said, we've read your beginning, and we'd like to see the rest. <laughs> At that point, I actually wasn't sure which beginning they were talking about. <laughs> I had so many out there, but I worked it out, and in a, a great frenzy of excitement and creativity, I sat down and wrote the rest, I think, in something like six weeks. And I set that off, and they promptly rejected it. <laughs> and that happened three times. I refer you back to the soul-destroying part of the process. Three times. And the funny thing about Julius Caesar was that I was sitting in somebody else's classroom, and I... I was doing what I always did, I forgot to bring my books with me. Um, you'll be surprised, but I'm not always this well organised. And <laughs> the thing is, the class was sitting in silence and I had nothing to do. So I used to pick up the books and, and read all sorts of strange things and learn all sorts of strange things. And I came across a scene of Augustus Caesar throwing the heads of Julius Caesar's assassins at the foot of his statue in Rome. And I knew that you know, there were 23 old assassins, and I knew the head is the single heaviest part of the body, and I knew you can't go carry 23 heads. It's impossible. I mean, even if you had a sort of pyramid arrangement, you'd have to do it <laughs> in, in relays. So I was wondering how this would work. So I was looking into the relationship between two men that would make him even want to do such a thing. And I went away, and instead of doing just the beginning, for the first time in years, I wrote for two years. And I wrote the story of a young Julius Caesar. And I gave up with my fanciful 
um, synopses and clever letters and unusual names and pairs between the pages. And I, I just said something like um, to the agent, I said, this is a story about the young Julius Caesar. I hope you like it and feel you can recommend it to publishers full stop comic. And she said, actually, it was a huge relief. It was um, a lovely, clean letter, very simple. And she, compared to all the other ones, doing all the fancy tricks and everything else, she really liked it. Um, and the point is that that was the one that, that they actually accepted. That was the one they finally said yes to uh, so many years ago. So whether, even though I, I did have the, uh, the, the laying on of hands and the, the you know, use of magic in the book, it's still, I can't regret it because it's the one, as I say, that you know, I've got my big foot in the door with that one. And it's been very difficult for them to close the door ever since. Um, I've got, don't clap! Don't clap! I've got, another, I've got one minute! One minute, you're killing me! I've got to finish, and a hand goes up here. God, I say I've got to finish. I was going to mention Bernard Cornwall, but then I realised it's only one minute. Shall I, tell, shall I tell you the story? Yeah, exactly. It'll take three minutes. Alright. I know, for anyone sitting there thinking, no, that was a disappointing moment. <laughs> when I did the Davis book for boys, it was actually the Bloomsbury. And I finished the book, and after six months of working with my brother in the shed, and I handed it in, and they said, it's great, we like it, but, they said, we need you to cut these chapters. There are certain chapters here which are controversial. And uh, one was hunting and shooting a rabbit, and another was the fact that I referred to fathers when it came to making uh, sh um, sheds in trees, what they call, tree houses, and things like that. And they said, we can't, we, we'll give you two options. Well, either, you, either you cut this and we'll sell shed loads, was the, uh, the phrase they used, or you don't cut them, it's your choice, and then we will price it at £25 and effectively kill it stone dead. <laughs> I don't know, it was a tough old decision. I, I, rang, uh, I rang my brother and I said, look, here's this decision. And he said, bless him, because it's the one time that completely useless man um, <laughs> justified his inclusion in the project. And he said, I don't care if we only sell one book, but we just get the publisher's promotional copies to stick on our own shelves for our own kids, as long as it's the book that we put together in six months, on our, you know, exactly as we, we hoped it would be. And I said, all right, but I can't exactly go back to them, Harry, and say, you know that nuclear option that you said was going to be really awful? I'd like to go for that, please. <laughs> <laughs> so I really, I genuinely didn't know what to do. So I thought, well, I met Bernard Paul. I met him twice, and we've had lunch together. And he was very, but we sort of got on. So obviously, he was vastly more experienced than me. So I emailed him to say, look, here's the situation. I don't know what to do at this point. I'm stuck. And he said, put it on a motorbike and send it across London to Susan Watts, who was the lady who was sitting here. And, uh, you know, she accepted it as it was, without any of the edits. It was something that, in my memory, it was about three weeks before Father's Day, and they had to go with almost without editing. It went in with some minor errors, in fact, because they were trying to get it out incredibly quickly. And, but on the other hand, it was exactly the book that I wanted it to be, and the book that my brother you know, wanted it to be. So, thanks to Bernie Cornwall, it, it worked out very well in the end. And uh, I don't know what the moral is there, but thank you very much for uh, being such a good audience, and such an absolute joy. Thank you.